The third way of reducing complexity, again, focuses on reducing the number of binary variables that are in the formulation. Um, but instead of, say, a cut or just plain changing a uh, integer variable to a continuous variable, we can take advantage of the fact that when we define a set and we have an index that takes the value of individual entities within that set, if we're careful about how we just define the sets to begin with and only include the, the uh, members in that set that really you know, we want to have as part of the optimization problem, we can actually eliminate the, the binary decision or, or integral decision variables uh, from the problem entirely. So the, the third approach here is to formulate what we'll call sparse sets instead of index ranges. The example I've shown is, again, we're going to take our, our power production schedule where we have some system state that's um, monitored or, or dictated by the variable y sub t. Uh, in the previous example, we've uh, specified the y sub t to uh, be such that t can take any value in the range from 1 to n, right, where n is the length of the horizon. So our set script t is 1, 2, 3, so on, up to n. That's fine. Uh, to deal with that, we introduced a cut, and that cut reduced a lot of the problem where the uh, value of y could not take the value, or the value of yt could not take on the value 1. Uh, instead of that approach, now we can only include those in indices where it is possible to operate to begin with. So instead of allowing the optimizer to d determine whether or not y sub t should be 0 or 1, we can, through our knowledge of the problem, through our, our specific knowledge of the system involved in the way that we're solving the problem, we can formulate so that we only include uh, those time indices where W sub T can have uh, production value. Um, so this takes a pre-processing of the problem. It takes our own special knowledge of the way uh, of, of the way this problem should be formulated. But instead of then having T be this uh, script T be this range from one to N, we just selectively choose the, the indices that we want T to iterate over. Um, so that's indicated here in this diagram, we, we take our time series, we take out the regions where we know that it's not going to be good enough, you know, the power, the power available is not enough to actually operate the system. We actually take those out of the problem entirely, and you have this kind of piecemeal uh, result that uh, means that we actually have a lot fewer binary variables to begin with. Um, so here in this ex example, our set of T, script T, we would then denote this as maybe a modified set, which we call script T hat. And that, that uh, set is only the indices here where there's um, uh, the potential for operation. We can also reduce the number of variables in a given problem by breaking up the problem into subproblems. Um, often in, in scheduling, especially in scheduling of energy systems, you see that over some sufficiently long time horizon, the patterns of scheduling will repeat themselves. So take, for example, a system that is uh, running based on solar energy or a system that's running based on wind, en wind energy. Uh, day to day, you see that um, there's a natural cycling that occurs, that the sun comes up, the sun goes down, right? The wind will blow at night and not during the day, uh, that kind of thing. And that cycling that will repeat itself over, over time uh, can be used to your advantage when it comes to optimizing the operations of the system. So we can take, uh, let's say we have an example here where we have a 48-hour horizon, and we're trying to optimize the operations of the system over the 48-hour horizon using our really uh, uh, kind of painfully simple problem here we're just determining the system state as a function of time. So in this 48-hour horizon, you know, you could imagine you get enough complexity in the problem, you have constraints and variables, that the 48-hour problem actually becomes difficult to solve. Uh, but we can take advantage of the fact that uh, there's kind of a point at which the system kind of resets. At, at some point in time, um, the system resets uh, by 
you know, the storage will discharge, for example, or you're in the middle of the night, you just can't operate. Um, and so there's, there's no real carryover effect from one time step to the next at that kind of uh, reset point. You can take advantage of that and break the problem up into sub problems where you just optimize the first piece of the problem and then you move on and optimize the second piece and then you go back later and kind of cobble together all of your solutions to be the full time horizon. So this is called a rolling time horizon type optimization. Um, it's often not as simple as this, right? You, you do have things like energy storage that you care about or some carryover from day to day. Um, so the way that you can deal with that is you, you know, say you solve a, um, you want to solve a 48 hour problem. You could solve this by um, maybe solving a 36 hour problem, right? So you'd solve a 36 hour problem. So you catch some of the day to day carryover and then you move forward 12 hours and solve the next 36 problem. But every time you solve it, you're only taking the first 24 hours. Right? So you solve a bigger problem, a longer term problem, you take the first chunk of that problem and implement it, um, or take that as the solution, and then you step forward in this, this sliding time horizon. So that's one way that you can create sub problems that are tractable, um, where as you go to longer and longer time horizons, the problem grows exponentially and becomes more difficult. So now let's move on to talk about the fifth method in this list. Uh, and actually the fifth and the sixth method are pretty similar. They're actually related to each other in that as the solver is uh, going about solving this problem, uh, if there's a big difference in the coefficients in your matrix, uh, that is, if you have a matrix of co where columns are the variables, the decision variables, and rows are constraints, if the coefficients in that matrix uh, are, if there's a large variation in their order of magnitude, it actually becomes a lot harder to solve that problem. The solver can kind of struggle with that. Some of that's due to numerical precision, but a lot of it's due to the cost function that it's evaluating as it's making decisions. So if you have a really big coefficient that's really dominating uh, the cost function as it's trying to go from iteration to iteration, um, you can get some kind of weird cycling and, and non-convergence behaviors, uh, and that just slows down the solution. So what you want to do is make sure that as much as possible, all the coefficients in your matrix, like all the coefficients on your variables, are in the same roughly order of magnitude, or you know, really it's down to several orders of magnitude with any uh, with, with similarity similarity to each other. Um, so the specific concern that you have when you're using uh, something called the big M constraint, which we, we talked about in the last example, is that uh, if you choose a value of M, right, this M needs to be a sufficiently large number so that your constraint does what you want it to do. If you choose a sufficiently large number that's more than sufficient, right, that is very, very large compared to the other coefficients in the matrix, um, that can slow down your solution. So we need to be careful with our selection of the value of big M whenever we use that in a constraint. Um, so in this example, we have uh, our same system we've been dealing with, but now we're going to introduce this idea that you can uh, produce power by uh, looking at the available power and going anywhere between zero and the available power. And so before we just said, the power output was the binary times the available power. Now we're going to introduce a variable lowercase w sub t, where lowercase w sub t can take any value between 0 and the maximum power at that time step t. Um, so what we want is, uh, first we're going to say this power um, has to be less than or equal to the operational variable y sub t. Um, so uh, what, what this constraint is saying is that if y sub t is zero, then I can't produce any power. Um, but if it is one, then I can produce uh, some you know, non-zero power, some, some large power. So a bad way of formulating this problem is to say that w sub t is less than or equal to this big M, 
times the binary. And we'd just make this big M a really large number. And then separately, we'd introduce some uh, constraint related to the power available, right? So this binary is uh, dictating the operational state of the system. But the mismatch between the coefficients, let's say we chose 1 times 10 to the you know 10th for our big M. That certainly will make it so that the constraint can be satisfied when yt is 1. However, uh, it causes the problem, again, to be very unsolvable or very unstable from the solver's perspective. So a better way of uh, picking the value of big M is to pick the largest value that WT could ever take. So in this problem, the largest value, let's say we either we look through the, uh, the, the time series capital W sub T and we find the largest value, or maybe we know something about the system and its actual maximum power output. You have some you know, power rating on it or uh, you have an inverter that's, that's sized for a certain load or, or something like that. In that, in, in that example, you have then some knowledge outside of the formulation. You have some knowledge of the system that you can use to help you select a better value for the maximum power output. So we substitute our big M value for an actual maximum value. It doesn't change anything about the problem. It doesn't change anything about the, the way that this thing works, except that it makes it easier for the solver to find the solution. So this is called uh, tightening the constraints. And this is not just for big M. This is not just for this type of constraint. It's really anywhere in your problem where you have uh, inequality constraint and the variable can take a value between uh, you know, the range that you specify. You want the, the limits on that range to be as close as possible to the order of magnitude of the other coefficients.